Hi, I'm Guy Powell, and welcome to the next episode of the Backstory on the Shroud of Turin. If you haven't already done so, please visit GuyPowell.com and sign up for more episodes. I am the author of the new book, The Only Witness, a historical fiction tracing a possible history of the Shroud over the last two millennia. Today, we're speaking with Russ Briault. He's a longtime researcher and speaker on the Shroud, and today we're going to talk about the meaning of the Shroud over the years and over the centuries and over the millennia. So uh, welcome, uh, Russ. Hey, Guy. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. So, uh, well, let me tell uh, folks about you. I, I know they know about you, but nevertheless, I've got a couple of things here, and then we can get right into it. So um, Russ has been researching and lecturing on the Shroud of Turin for over 30 years, and uh, he has a highly acclaimed presentation known as the Shroud Encounter, making use of over 200 images, and it unfolds like a CSI investigation. He's presented to hundreds of audiences from New York to Hawaii, and he's appeared in nationally televised documentaries, including Mysteries of the Ancient World on CBS, Uncovering the Face of Jesus on the History Channel, and CNN's Finding Jesus. He's a longtime member of the Shroud Science Group, which is an international consortium of scientists and scholars dedicated to further research on the Shroud. And he's also the president and founder of the Shroud of Turin Education Project. And it has the mission to advance the knowledge of the Shroud to a new generation. So, uh, so great to have you, Russ, and it's always great to uh, talk with you and uh, learn more about uh, about uh, the shroud and uh, and your impressions on and 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 the things that you know on the shroud. So, uh, um, with that, let's start with um, uh, with something right out of John, and uh, this is then when Peter and John they're in the tomb, they've seen the empty tomb, they've seen the cloths lying there. And John says in twenty, uh, in chapter twenty, verse eight, he says that he saw and he believed. And uh, now he said that. Now, do you think it? Uh, what do you think about Peter? Uh, do you think he had the same impressions? Do you think he finally saw and believed, or do you think there was some doubt still in his mind? Well, in 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 Luke's gospel, it says he walked away wondering. So I, I think John. Um, you know, it, it it wasn't a secret that Jesus, the rumor was that this Jesus was going to rise again from the dead. That's why the Romans had put soldiers in front of the tomb. I mean, you're not expecting anyone to rise again from the dead. No other tomb is guarded. <laughs> you know, it's uh, and so so John, I mean, at least in three separate look um, uh, times in the in the gospel, Jesus says on the third day he would rise again from the dead. So so for John, he said, OK, uh, he must have risen from the dead because the body isn't here. <laughs> but, you know, Peter, maybe not quite so believing, uh, walks away wondering. And um, and uh, I have a theory on this, though, it, is this uh, uh, just an interesting thought on this is, you know, there's a story in Acts chapter 10 where, and you know, where Peter has his vision, right? He's up on the roof. He's praying. It's at noontime. And he has a vision. Now, before I talk about that, Cornelius, the Roman centurion, has a visitation from an angel who tells Cornelius, now, now Cornelius is a devout man. Um, he's He's not a Christian, but I think he wants to become one. He wants to be one, but he doesn't know how. And so this, this angel shows up and tells him to go and send his men to find Peter. Well, so, so they are dispatched to find Peter. Meanwhile, Peter's up on the roof having a vision. What is his vision? He sees a sheet coming down out of heaven with, with animals that are both clean and unclean. And he hears the voice of God saying, Peter, kill and eat. And it's um, and Peter says, no, Lord, I've never I've never had anything unclean. You know, I've, I've kept all these dietary laws, you know, and then this this cloth comes down three times and and says basically God saying what what I have said to be clean. You know, don't don't you say it's unclean if I've said it's clean. And so 
So right after that vision, um, Cornelius's men show up. And so they say that Cornelius would want to talk with you. And so Peter then follows him, follows these guys back to Cornelius's house. Now, Cornelius is a Gentile. Peter goes right inside the house. He would never have done that had it not been for the vision that he perceived that basically saying that, all right, well, the Gentiles were unclean, but according to God, now they're clean. So I guess it's okay for me to go into this house. And he begins to share the gospel. And as you might know the story, the, the Holy Spirit fell on them and they all began speaking in other tongues. And this was a sign to Peter that indeed this Christian, this, this new way was not just for the Jews, but for but for the world. And now what's, what's intriguing to me, now think about this. This vision that Peter had up on the roof, God could have showed him all these animals in a wagon, in a barrel, in a field, in any any imaginable situation. Why did why were they shown him in a sheet that comes down three times? Well, what other sheet exists that breaks down the barrier between Jew and Gentile and between God and man? I mean, Paul writes in Hebrew, says, now we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Couldn't do that before. You had to let the, let the, let the high priest take your, take your prayers into the Holy of Holies. So, so what, why a sheet? And I think, I, think this is, I think this is God's way of explaining to Peter what it was, it was in his care because the early legends say that it was Peter who had, who was given the shroud and in its, um, mm. so I don't know. I just think that's real curious. Why a sheet? Why, why not a wagon, a barrel, a field or some other, you know? And so I, I that's just a thought, you know, it's um, right. Right. Yeah. It is interesting that uh, the sheet, um, you know, does show up in that uh, particular in instance, especially when the, you know, the, the Jews had been practicing, you know, eating what's clean and not eating pork and not eating shellfish and whatever else was, uh, you know, was, uh, was prohibited from, from them eating. And here it is, he can now, you know, the sheet comes down and he can now you know, he's being told by God, hey, you can eat whatever you'd like to. And uh, I never thought about, you know, him going into the house of the Gentile, that that would have been considered unclean. But that yeah, that's correct. That that makes a lot of sense as well. Yeah. So basically what what sheet uh, may, breaks down that barrier, it's the linen shroud covered with the blood of Christ, the atoning blood, which basically is the blood of the new covenant. And mm. this is what the new covenant is all about. And then, so, uh, so anyway, I just find that very curious, you know, and um, I'm, I, I, I'm not saying it's proof. I'm just saying it's pretty interesting. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I do like the, uh, the, the, the symbolism and the imagery and, and here he is, he, he had the cloth. Uh, well, it, it's probable that he had the cloth, but he definitely, you know, he absolutely saw that cloth. He must have seen the blood on that cloth. Um, he, he most likely saw the markings on that cloth and he most likely saw them afterwards, certainly. And so, uh, to be able to then, uh, now use that again in the symbol, symbol, uh, in the symbolism that of the, of the what's clean and the what's not clean in Acts 10, I'm going to have to reread that verse. I, that's, that's pretty good. I appreciate that. Yeah. So then what do you think about, um, early, I call it proto-Christian, um, but early Christianity, they weren't quite Christians yet. The term hadn't been quite used yet, but they're they're certainly trying to figure out what's going on. What do you think the shroud meant for them? I don't really know. Um, for the Jews, it would have been a conundrum uh, because it was it was unclean. It was doubly unclean. It was covered with blood, and it wrapped a corpse. Mm. And so, um, you know, what's What's curious is that I am have every confidence that that the apostles kept that cloth. There's no way they discarded it or threw it away. They just didn't know what to do with it. It's because in, in Acts chapter 19, it talks about Paul circulating aprons and napkins that had touched his body. 
Now he's passing them out among the people and they're all getting healed by touching something that belonged to Paul. Well, my goodness, what do you think? What kind of an anointing would have been associated with the burial shroud that wrapped Jesus? And so, but the problem is, 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 but they, they just couldn't bring it out for public view because it would have been destroyed. And it's uh, because, you know, there was a tremendous amount of persecution in the early church. And in fact, it was they were called the cult of martyrs. And, um, you know, and so th there was this discipline of the secret where they had to keep things, you know, quiet. And, and so uh, there there has to be a reason why there's no mention of the shroud after Resurrection Sunday. No mention of it. And, and even if it didn't have an image on it, you'd think something that that held the blood of the new covenant that even that at least would warrant a mention, but there's not, there's no mention of it at all. And I, and I think it's because when you think of when the gospels were written, you know, 30 to 40 years after the events in, um, in question, they think Mark was probably the earliest, maybe around 60 AD. And, uh, but that's exactly when persecution was really heating up. And so they didn't. So they're not going to put some verbal reference into a gospel. And because all because these gospels were circulated everywhere, they were all copied and handed out. And and so the Romans would have got their hands on it. And it's um, so um, I think that's the reason it's um, the. Um, uh, but as far as 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 how the shroud may have impacted the early believers, um, I, I don't think it was used to evangelize the, the Jews. I, I think I think it's it's because of the fear that there would be a search and destroy mission mm. set set forth to to destroy it if they could. This is why I think it was sent very early. Uh, get it out of Jerusalem uh, and I think it went to Edessa and mm. it's um and I know this there's a uh, difference of opinions between whether it went to Odessa or went to Antioch. I don't, I don't buy Antioch. It, it, and the reason is because if, if they're trying to send it to a place that's safe, you know, um, um, Antioch became the, a, a, a Roman center uh, in Syria around 60 BC. So by the first century, the place was buzzing with Romans, and why would you bring it there? I mean, um, uh, so Edessa was outside the range of the Roman Empire, and um, and so it to me, if you're looking for a place to bring it to keep it safe and protect it, I think Edessa makes a better choice, and that's certainly where all of the legends say it went. Mm. Well, and plus, uh, in Edessa, you had the whole kingdom, you know, with Apgar basically then, you know, bringing uh, Christianity and converting the whole kingdom to Christianity. So that also leads to a lot more protection of it. And uh, and to your point, it is pretty far away from where the Romans are. And, you know, it, it seems like there's there's two different stories. One is that it goes to Edessa, kind of like you're saying, and then as you mentioned, the other one going to uh, to Antioch. Um, Antioch, on the other hand, uh, was one of the five patriarchs. And so, you know, maybe maybe that's where Paul went back and forth, bringing it uh, with him. Maybe he went there to avoid the the Jews as well in uh, Jerusalem and get it out to maybe where there's more Gentiles and where he could show something like that to the Gentiles. That, uh, but certainly either one of those stories, whether it went to Antioch or went to Odessa, is certainly possible. Mm hmm. Yeah, I like your point too that uh, Antioch would have been a, um, uh, you know, there were there was a lot of a uh, lot more Roman activity there, and um, and then certainly had to get out of Jerusalem in the seventies when the when the the Jews revolted. You'd definitely want to be away from anything like that. And if you had a a relic or a you know something that is this valuable with Jesus's blood on it, you're going to want to get out of there. So I don't think it, you know, it stayed in Jerusalem very long at all. I agree with you. I think it was taken out pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so let's talk about Thomas a little bit. He, um, in the upper room, he, uh, uh, Jesus appears to the other disciples once and Thomas is not there. And then uh, I guess they all said, Thomas, you missed him, you know, come back. 
you got to see. And then, you know, Jesus comes the second time and he says, uh, put your fingers in the wound. And, um, and, and, you know, and now he sees and believes, what do you, uh, what do you think was going through Thomas's mind at that point? Well, you know, it's, it's, it, it's an interesting story it is because as you said, Thomas wasn't there the first time Jesus showed up and you can imagine uh, I mean, when Thomas left, everyone was depressed and glum and freaked out and scared to death that they were next. And then when when Thomas returned, maybe that night, maybe the next day, you can imagine how the chemistry had completely changed. I mean, everyone running up to Thomas and Thomas is, <laughs> and they're saying, Thomas, it's true. He is alive. <laughs> he was here. We touched him. We broke bread. We he talked about the kingdom. <laughs> Where were you? And then you know, Thomas classically, you know, folds his arms in that, you know, <laughs> kind of a kind of a defensive posture, right? And he and he says, not nah, I I says, I I I can't believe. I won't believe, not until I thrust my hand into his side and place my fingers into his nail wounds, right? And so then a week later you know um you know jesus shows up again in the upper room uh now you'd think that just the testimony of everybody around them saying that they had seen him that that would be enough to convince him that that jesus had risen from the dead especially since jesus said he was going to rise from the dead on three different locations i mean th three different times and um but it wasn't enough, which is why he's forever known as Doubting Thomas, right? And so then it, it so it takes a whole week. Jesus shows up again. First person he speaks to is, is Thomas. And he says, Thomas, come here. And then, of course, you know, he quotes his own words back to him. He says, he says, Thomas, thrust your hand into my side and place your fingers into my nail wounds and be not faithless, but believe. Now, I actually don't believe Thomas took Jesus up on the offer. Okay. It's like, okay, Jesus, stand still. This might hurt. <laughs> A little bit you know i mean i just i'm not buying that you know i think i think jesus standing there would have been plenty of proof <laughs> and yeah then, well and, and then, even if you and even if he's standing there and he, he's showing the wounds and he's got the wounds in his hands i mean uh, that's pretty good proof <laughs> i don't think you need anything else <laughs> the um and then of course after that he makes the strongest profession of faith in the entire New Testament. He says, my Lord and my God. I mean, Peter said at another time, he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the, the son of the living God. But no, no, but Thomas made it personal. And, um, and so, which then, but he couldn't do it. Now, this is a really an interesting thing. He couldn't say it until he was face to face with the resurrected mm. Christ for himself. And I've always believed that this is the message of the shroud, that this is why it exists for the doubting Thomases of our day, that that in some vicarious fashion, we, too, can kind of thrust our hand into his side and, you know, and or at least see his, his side wound and his, and his nail wounds. And and um, but as I always say to to my uh, my evangelical friends, I said, listen, don't worry about this. The, the, the shroud can never replace faith. Hmm. Um, it, it's, it's, I think personally, you know, the old expression that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I think the shroud takes you right up to the water's edge, but it doesn't replace faith. It's still going to take an act of faith to then personalize it and, and, and make a, a personal leap of faith into, into believing that, Indeed, this this Jesus is the Son of God, and to make him and to make him your Lord and your Savior, that is a step of faith. The shroud can the shroud can get you close, but you're still going to have to, you know, take that step of faith. Well, it's interesting too, and and I I, I agree with that, uh, and I I really like the way Jesus then entered that conversation with Thomas, which is blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, right. because that right there is certainly for the future for those of us that after, you know, Jesus is uh, walks after the resurrection walks on earth and appears a handful of times. And then he's uh, you know, he ascends into heaven. And, uh, and, um, and so for us, that is really the only way that we, can you know believe is blessed are us so to speak that have not seen and yet believe mm -hmm. and um and and yet those 12 apostles or i guess 11 at that moment they were then um 
able to actually, you know, see him in person right there, see the wounds if they wanted to, and uh, and then realize that the cloth, the shroud, reflects exactly all of those wounds, everything that he suffered on those last on that last day from the uh, the trial to the whipping to the scourging and then to the crucifixion and then uh you know the descent from the cross and then into the tomb it's uh, it's pretty impressive it's it really makes sense but you know one thing too though as you were talking i was thinking um the people that actually saw the cloth weren't really that many it was uh you know if it was in edessa it may have been hidden because of the discipline of the secret it went to Constantinople, so maybe only the emperors and the bishops and the archbishops and whatever, the cardinals got to see it. But I, I don't think the, the the common people got to see it very often. Um, you know, maybe it was displayed uh, once in a while, you know, with when it came in and uh, possibly when it came in 944 to, into Constantinople, that was maybe the only time that it was actually shown or, or uh, you know, prior to that, uh, it really may not have been shown that much. So no, there must have right. been a lot of, yeah, so there must have been a lot of talk about, hey, there's a cloth, there's a this, there's a that, but, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't really seen by uh, by too many people. And this is probably also is what, you know, spawned the growth of iconography, it, you know, the icon images uh, beginning in the sixth century based on what was then known as the true likeness, which we today would, would think is the shroud itself that was, you know, rediscovered and you know, and 200 years past Constantine, it's safe to be a Christian now. So it's so it's said to be the true likeness of Christ, not made by human hands. And and so so your icon images all conform then to what we see on the shroud with long hair, full beard, large hollow eyes, long flattened nose. And and so stylistically, these icon images literally proliferate all through the east and every church and even even homes have personal icons based on the true likeness so even though very few people saw the actual shroud they they saw the icon images based on the shroud which were which were everywhere mm. and it's um so yeah so it's interesting it's you know, ancient version of photography the um <laughs> the uh so I, I I think it's um um the it's the significance of the shroud I I think was um in kind of being revealed in the sixth century I think was was also a, a way of dealing with various heresies which said that Jesus didn't come in the flesh and it, this is the orthodox way of saying oh yes he did and this is what he looked like. And it's um, so I think it, you know, because because the 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 important thing here is that Jesus rose from the dead physically, bodily. And there's a lot of mystical type views. Oh, he only he only rose from the dead spiritually. Well, in that case, there should still be a body in the tomb. And that's the problem, because that was the point. The tomb was empty. And it's um, so he rose from the dead physically. And what's interesting you know, during the whole early centuries, during the cult of martyrs, um, the the bones of saints and martyrs were considered holy. And these these, these early believers would 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 carry with them a, a bone fragment of a saint or a martyr, believing that this fragment uh, would give them strength. And, and it's um, and so and the Romans knew this. And so a lot of times they would destroy and burn into ashes the, the bones of the martyrs and even throw them into the yeah, after that they throw it into the river so that the martyrs couldn't have any piece of the uh, of it at all. And it's um and so what's what's interesting is 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 that the is it their um there there's a lot of um when you look when you look at the scripture, there's there's a lot of reverence placed on the bones mm. of those who have passed. Every ancient church is built on the bones of some martyr or some saint. And it creates a physical connection between this life and the next. And that in that in, in what's interesting though, is that there's no bones for Jesus, <laughs> but we have his linen shroud. 
And so again, we have something physical in this realm that connects us to the next, just mm. as the same way that the bones of the martyrs did. And um, so I think that's an interesting thought. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, I appreciate that the um uh those bones are in all of those ancient churches. And uh, you know, and, and I'm sure you've traveled through Europe and you get to see those bones and then you get to see how they're they're venerated uh by the you know by the congregation and the visitors and what have you yeah that uh that is an interesting way to do it though or to talk about it is that that is the connection between here and then and the afterlife so that's uh that's really nice so uh now going back uh to those early first maybe the first century maybe the second century um do you think the jews knew about the cloth do you think there was uh knowledge of the cloth and what do you think they uh, may have uh, thought about it, or that certainly maybe the Jewish hierarchy knew knew that there was something there, because um, it would have been obvious that they, you know, they, there had to have been somebody talking about it and and something like that. Yeah, and and hence that gives further uh, credence to the notion that the shroud was removed from it from Jerusalem pretty early, mm. and it's um uh so. I, I don't I'm sure they were knowledgeable of it. Um, I mean, it's uh, I mean, Joseph of Arimathea, who purchased the the shroud, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And mm. it's um, it probably wasn't a secret that he purchased this linen shroud for this purpose. He was a secret follower. And Nicodemus, <clears throat> you know, he he probably <laughs> had to come clean about his 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 following Jesus, you know, afterwards. I mean. I think Joseph was a little bolder, a little more open, um, but um, but the, the um, yeah, you know what's interesting is I I I I believe in the in the story of uh, of of Abgar, uh, the king of the city state of Edessa, dying of leprosy, and in fact, in in, in Matthew four twenty four, it says that is that is that the knowledge of Jesus was all through Syria as mm. this great healer and people from Syria were coming to him to be healed of various ailments and diseases. And so with Edessa being in Syria, it would make sense then that if you had a and had an ailing king, that he would probably send a messenger down to Jerusalem to see if he could arrange for something. And, um, and obviously Jesus says, uh, I love to help, but I'm a little busy right now. And it's, <laughs> uh, and so, and so he promises to send one of his followers later. Well, now that turns out to be St. Jude. And it's, um, at least according to tradition. In fact, this is Orthodox view is a very much all through is Jude is all through it. And it's, um, so Jude, along with the messenger, bring this cloth. And uh, now, uh, no, no, let, me, let me back up and just say that that Abgar dispatches the messenger with a letter requesting that Jesus come and come back to Edessa to bring healing to the king. And I, I think personally, it's my little twist on the historical here, is that um, is that uh, um, Jude was dispatched to fulfill the request of the king. He arrives in Edessa, and, and I think personally, Abgar is healed just the same way everyone else was healed with the laying on of hands. That's how they did it. And then, you know, bingo, he's healed of his leprosy. And according to the, the historical, according to the record, uh, I think his, uh, one of the king's uh, associates was healed of gout at the same time. And it's, um, so, so, but personally, I have a hard time thinking that that um, Jude would bring the cloth to Edessa without knowing who this king is or how he was going to respond to the Christian message. Now, certainly, he was interested because he was asking Jesus to come. Um, but uh, at the same, so I, I have this, I have this view that 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 um, um, Jude probably traveled there twice, once mm. to heal the king, comes back, regroups, all the apostles are having a meeting, persecution is heating up, and then a little, a little group meeting there, and they're saying, what are we going to do with the shroud? What, you know, what can we do? We have to preserve it. We have to keep it safe. And, there, and, there's, and there's Jude in the back saying, 
I've got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> the king of the king of the city state of Edessa is a fervent believer, and I know he would take care of it and preserve it. Let's bring it there. So I just have a belief that he probably took it there on the second time around. The record shows that it was both um, Jude as as well as um, Simon the Zealot, uh, not Simon Peter, Simon the Zealot mm -hmm. evangelized throughout all of Syria. And legend has it about 60,000 people were had come to Christ through their through their evangelization. And and um, so that's just my my twist on the on the on the history of it. So, um, so yeah, well, it's interesting. I don't know how far exactly Odessa is from Jerusalem or Je about 400 Odessa, maybe miles, about 400 miles. So getting back and forth is not an easy thing either. But if if you are if you're going to have the ability to uh, potentially convert the, the whole kingdom and uh, and then convert this king and then the whole you know royal line that's going to follow him, that is uh, that's definitely a, a reason to at least, uh, you know, go back there and, and possibly bring the shroud. And 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 to your point as well as uh, keeping it safe has got to be, you know, of utmost importance. I can't imagine they were feeling very safe just living in Jerusalem, even potentially even living in Antioch, where there's also, you know, this this enormous Roman presence there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's fun to speculate. There's obviously huge gaps in, in the history that mm. we just don't know, but it, it's, um, but you know, that the whole pattern of water stains and on, on the shroud with the only way we can replicate them, uh, they're, they're not associated with the burns. Um, because when we match up the burns, the water stains don't match up. So mm. there's, they're, they're separate. They're, they're separate incidents and it's, um, and so the only way we can replicate those water stains is by by folding. I think it's 48 layers, kind of like about you fold it up to about the size of a record album. Mm. And then you kind of roll it and put it vertically into a a, 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 a clay a, pot. Yep. And then and if you can imagine somehow some water got in there and it tilted on its side a little bit. We know we can fully replicate the water stains by doing that, and which is really intriguing because that is a method of storage that is uniquely Middle Eastern and is certainly ancient. We don't have any record of it. Uh, every every record of, of how the Shah was stored is always in some kind of a box. Mm. We don't have any record of it being stored in in a um, in a clay pot. And yet those and yet those water stains in this very clear pattern are the result of a calcium type of a deposit, which would have been absorbed from the clay pot. Mm. And it's um, so I think that's a real intrigue. You can imagine how it was probably when the, I don't know how how they traveled back then, whether it was on camel or horse or or a, some kind of a wagon. But, you know, somehow as they were going from Jerusalem to Odessa, they got caught in a rainstorm. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and it, I just think that's real intriguing. Well, and I think too, the, the clay pot is certainly a way to disguise that you have something of value. So if you typically would find, I don't know, oil or, uh, or rice or something else in, or beans in those pots and, you just have three or four clay pots and one of them happens to be disguised with the shroud inside of it. And, and then to your point, you know, it could have easily rained or it could have been, who knows what happened and the water could have seeped in without any, you know, without any, without, a, without any cause or whatever, it could have been, you know, anything that could have done that. Yeah. It's really interesting, you know, I mean, and, and it, and it is uniquely Middle Eastern. Hmm. Well, and there's so many different, uh, you know, when all of these digs uh, that they do, there are so many clay pots that are found. And so it is absolutely, uh, you know, something that would be easy to store anything. I mean, you that's could, how like that's a, how the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Yeah. The same thing. Yep, absolutely. 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 So, uh, OK, so then uh, potentially we have the shroud going from Jerusalem to Edessa. Then um, tell us about maybe how it may have gotten from Edessa to Constantinople. Well, uh, accordingly, you know, I guess Edessa fell to Islam in the mid eighth century or so. And so now here it is, 944, and the emperor of Constantinople 
is concerned over the safety and well-being of the true likeness, the most holy of all Christian relics, and and uh, uh, according to the story, sends the entire Byzantine imperial army down to a down to Edessa. <clears throat> He's not looking for a fight, though. He brings with him two hundred prisoners of war, bags of silver. He's looking for a trade. And so the Muslims, the Muslims were pretty sharp, and they said, "We'll take that deal." And so, without <laughs> any kind of bloodshed, <clears throat> they return to Constantinople with great, with great celebration and fanfare on August sixteenth of nine forty four, and they're parading it through the streets, and and it's, um, and so there's a, you know, the the Gregory, the Archdeacon of the Hagia Sophia, he delivers a sermon that that night um, in the palace. And according to the story that's written, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the historical record shows that they laid this cloth out on the emperor's tomb and crowned it with the emperor's crown. My goodness, I, what more symbolism do you need for something that they thought was associated with the, with the, with the king of kings? And then, then Gregory, he starts his sermon and he's talking about, you know, sweat and image there, you know, you know, and blood and water here. Right? Sweat and image is look, he's pointing to the face as mm. he's, not, he's not mentioning paint. Sweat and image is what he says the is what is the cause of it. And then blood and water, he's obviously pointing to the side wound. So now we're not talking about a face image. We're talking about a full body image. And and it's um, so it's very very interesting it's um and so um and so this this then become of course at this point around this time it uh, is also referred to as the mendelian um which it gets a little confusing is is because the mendelian really means kind of a small cloth because i think that's what they called it when it was folded up if you mm. if you fold up if you if you double it in four remember one of the references to the description of the shroud is a is a is a tetra diplune meaning doubled in four is so if you double it in four all you're going to see is the face image and but notice it's very intriguing though that the aspect ratio and with the shroud it's narrow it's about three and a half feet wide and 14 feet long but if you fold it double it in four then all of a sudden it becomes a very it it's it, it's about this high but this wide so mm. it, so it's a very so it has a horizontal aspect ratio um and that's exactly what you put that in a frame and that's exactly what some of the early icon images of the of the Odessa icon and the true likeness all have this wide horizontal aspect ratio which would which would comport with the shroud being folded in such a way as only you see the face. So the face is only at the center, but the cloth itself is this wide. Mm. And it's, um, and so, uh, so that's, and so that would have been known as the Mendelian. And what, what becomes complicated then is that, is that any cloth that has touched a relic becomes a relic. So now you have painted copies made of the face that's on the shroud and if they touched it, and if they were authorized to to touch it, then it too becomes a Mandelian. Hmm. And so now you've got these multiple Mandelians. Well, one is the original, and the other ones are painted copies that have touched the original. And so, which is why you, you have a situation where in, I think it's... 1243 it's uh, well the the shroud disappears in 1204 during the fourth crusade but there is an inventory uh talking about what was sent to uh was it uh king king of france bought a, a bunch yeah. of items from constantinople and in that inventory was listed the mandelian well wait a minute I thought the shroud was stolen in 1204 and from Constantinople. So how can it be sold in 1243 to the king of France? Well, because the Mandelian was a painted copy of the face. Hmm. Base, you know, and so they so there's a little conflation there. And um so um um but that's uh, uh but certainly uh you know something so you have now you have two items. One be, also becomes known as the as the Sindon was was listed there and the Mandelian were two separate items. They weren't. 
they was the Mandelian is a painted copy based on uh, on, on the, the shroud. on the cloth that's on the shroud, and um, so the um, and then the shroud itself, the the Sindon, is you know in the in the Saint Mary's of Blackernai, which was a which was a province, a section of Constantinople, where that where they in twelve oh four at that period of time they were they were raising it up in a contraption every Friday. They were using it so for some kind of a liturgical kind of a device where, and so it would raise it up a little bit and it would represent Christ as a, as a baby or as a child to raise it up a little bit more, you know, Jesus as, as an adolescent, raise it up a little bit more, you know, Jesus as a man, all the way up, Jesus, the crucified Lord. And so they would raise it at four different levels uh, throughout the course of the day at the at the at the watches of the day 6 a.m 9 a.m noon and three o'clock when he gave up his spirit and it's um and so that's what was going on liturgically um and that was stolen and then um and then and then as you know there was a there was a reference in um a letter of protest was written um in 1205 saying that the saying that the sindon or the linen was in athens in 1205 mm. so now we know where it went it went to mm. athens and it's um so um yeah it's it's, just, it's great history. it's fascinating the uh you know how the history all comes together and uh and and also stays apart because there's you know all these little different things and um you know who knows maybe at some point there'll be a couple of more interesting papers discovered one thing i learned uh i was out with uh pete schumacher and he was the guy that um uh that trained uh john jackson and eric jumper on the vp8 image analyzer he's out in alamogordo new mexico and there's the shroud new mexico museum there and uh so we were talking and he has in the museum he has a, a backlit uh, image of the uh, the full length of the shroud and one of the things that was uh that he pointed out was around the face just like you see our faces around the face that area on the shroud is a lot lighter in the background area it's a lot lighter than anywhere else and so one of his uh, theories is that 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 brighter area is because that was always shown uh you know well not always but it was shown quite often and because it was out and exposed more often then the the cloth itself didn't may not have aged or whatever but it stayed a lot lighter and so which kind of you know backs up a lot about what you're talking about in terms of how it may have been folded and then shown and and um and then uh and 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 and, and presented to the public yeah the what's interesting is that when the when the shroud disappears in 1204, this fourth crusade was a debacle. It was never supposed to happen. Um, you know, the Pope Innocent III authorized the crusade to go down to the Holy Land, liberate the Holy Land from Muslim control. But, you know, they, as you know, they, 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 they weren't able to raise enough money to pay for all the ships that they had. The Doge of Venice, the King of the Duke of Venice, who built them a whole fleet of ships. And, um, and they were supposed to come up with 80,000 uh, uh, um, crusaders, only came up with 30,000. So they were way short of the money needed to pay for these ships. So then they came up with a hatch to plan to install the, the emperor had a nephew out there, uh, Angelus, whatever, the third or something like that. And so and so he made a deal and said he with the crusader, I'll tell you what, if you sail me to Constantinople and help me to get installed as the new emperor, I'll pay off all your debts. So they said, OK, we got we got nothing better to do. And so let's <laughs> uh, so they sail to Constantinople with their brand new ships and they and they tried to convince the 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 residents of Constantinople to embrace the nephew as their new emperor. But they but they didn't go for it. And so now war is inevitable. And um, so they finally, they get into the city and they go into three days of nothing more than just pillage and rape and then just, just destroy everything. I mean, you can imagine all these, you know, thousands of crusaders just, just going through the city, stealing it blind, all the gold, silver, ivory, relics of the saints, all go back to the West. 
Well, Pope Innocent III is so upset with this because he was envisioning an opportunity to reunite East and West again. <laughs> and it's not going to happen now. <laughs> and so he was really upset because that was his hope. That was his plan. And and so he, he issued an edict of excommunication for anyone who stole relics and, di- and did not send them back to Constantinople mm. and you're a crusader and you've been at this for two years and you're going to, you're going to send this back. He says, there's no way. And so, <laughs> so all this stuff goes underground, including the shroud, which goes underground for about 150 years and then reappears in, um, in Luray, France in 1356. And Jeffrey de Charnay has, has the possession of it. Now, isn't it curious that he had Jeffrey had to get authorization from the king uh, from the from the pope to display it and so he had to get the 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 blessing from the pope to do this but he was he was committed to a vow of silence he could not speak to a word as to and his entire family could say nothing about where they got this shroud no oh, why would you have a vow of silence regarding the origin of the shroud unless it had been stolen from Constantinople and the Pope knew that if they said that, they'd have to return it to Constantinople. And, um, and so, so you have this vow of silence and, and um, so, which negates all these ridiculous theories that the, that the shroud is some kind of a medieval artwork of some kind. Well, why the vow of silence then? Why do you have to have a vow of silence for something that you know is just a painted copy or a mm. painted or just a painting? You know, no, of course not. It, it this this vow of silence is a pretty strong piece of uh, data that says that they knew it was from Constantinople, and um, which is you know, which if you link it to Constantinople, then then this then this cloth, which you know it has a has a documented history at least to when it came from Edessa. You know, in the, you know, 944 and earlier than that. Yeah, yeah. So that then links it from uh, 1350s, 1360s or so down to 1204 with the Fourth Crusade, then back down to 944 with uh, Gregory Referendarius, the deacon or whatever it was when he marched it around the, the city. So you have clear proof in three different ways that the, the shroud existed before the you know, and it couldn't have been then a medieval forgery or it couldn't have been, you know, painted or anything else like that. Well, yeah, because, you know, we're always backed up against the carbon date of 1260 to 1390. And I can tell you, there's nobody in the 14th century that had the skills, the ability, the medical knowledge or anything else to come up with the Shroud of Turin. They just don't. Yeah, they're, they're not yeah. there. In fact, the the two 14th century artists that are referenced uh, by various skeptics. Uh, one of these artists is called Simone Martini, and 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 he was the kind of the the founder of the Siena School of Art, <clears throat> and you know, and he he died um, I think 1343, and he had a he had a student named Nato Cecciarelli who was basically had the same exact style. And he died in 1360. So the they allege that one of these two artists is responsible for the shroud image. Um, okay, so go go ahead and go Google Simone Martini and Nato Cecciarelli. Look at their artwork. Look at their crucifixion scenes, and see if anything even remotely resembles what we see on the shroud. Nothing. And I'm yeah. I'm not talking about use of our substances. I'm just talking about stylistically. And so so now we have to allege that one of these artists abandoned everything that they had learned about how to represent Christ in sacred art, forget everything they've ever learned and completely, you know, diverge <laughs> from how they're going it, 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 it it's just it's contrary to human nature and human logic, you know, so. um as in just some brief examples. So on, on the painted copies, you barely can see a crown of thorns. On the shroud, it's clear. There's marks mm. all over there, but very clear crown of thorns. On the painted copies, you have blood. On, on the shroud, the blood is flowing down the arm, pooling at the elbow. On the painted copies, the blood is, is dripping straight down 
into into the chalice held by an angel. You know, that's obviously artistic license. But how come it's not going down the arm like this? It's going straight down, and the uh, and then the nail is in the palm of the hand. We on the shroud, it's in the wrist. Um, you the uh, um, on the on the painted copies, you have the side wound, and the blood is spurting like it's a faucet, and yet. On the shroud, it's just oozing out of there. Why? This is post mortem blood flow. The 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 heart's no longer beating, and mm. so and so it's just not spurting. It's just oozing out of there, and it's um and so and even with the um so there's it's just there's many other oh and also when you look at the shroud, there are scourge marks all over the front chest and thighs as well as the back. On the painted copies, the chest is perfectly clean. Not a scourge mark can be seen. So, so we're asking then, assuming that these artists just suddenly abandoned everything that they had learned about how to represent Christ stylistically and then came up with the shroud. And of course, without the use of paint, ink, dye, pigmentation, or stain. And um, so <laughs> that's beyond a tall order. That's <laughs> that that's just a tall tale, is what that is. So yeah. Well, and plus to get the dimensions right, and and I've seen, and I, we were talking before. Uh, there is a shroud copy uh, that was originally generated for Maria Teresa over four hundred years ago, sixteen twenty four, and the quality of that shroud copy and and the replica that 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 the artist is trying to make, it's nowhere near what the quality of the of the image that that's on the shroud. Even if the image on the shroud were painted, all of the people that made copies of it over the centuries, they did a terrible job. They did an absolute terrible job. And so if they can't do a good job with that, how could someone do such a good job as to make the shroud into a forgery unless it's not a forgery? Right, exactly. There, There's about 50 known copies made, and they're all, as you said, just they're all terrible. They're terrible. You you wouldn't have one in your house. But 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 the but the only thing that makes it valuable is that all these copies were touched to the mm. original. And that would and this was allowed, authorized by the bishop and signed, you know, documented. And so it's the fact that they touched the real deal is what makes them valuable. Otherwise, they're just they're just laughable. And it's um and you know and so and so you know of all the of all the attempts to copy the shroud, <clears throat> I mean, and nobody's come up with anything. I mean, is because is because then this is before photography. You know, prior to when we understood that it was a negative image. You know that that becomes positive in a photo negative. You know, it's um the uh, so they're all trying to replicate or emulate this kind of weird negative image that we see on the cloth itself. And um, so now there are modern attempts that do a better job of replicating the shroud. But that's kind of cheating is because yeah. they have the knowledge of the photo negative, whereas the early copies had no knowledge of it. And so I think it's more instructive to look at those earlier copies, you know, before they had, you know, the benefit of modern technology. Yeah. Well, and plus the whole concept of a negative, it just it didn't even exist. It, uh, you know, it only came about when there was photography sometime in the in the late uh, 1800s. So, uh, you know, there it, it, it prior to that, there was no even no even concept of a negative. Russ, I'm going to have to break it off there. Uh, uh, as much as I'd love to keep going, <laughs> I could go on for hours or let you go on for hours. I know that uh, uh, you've got so much knowledge and and uh, information, but uh, let's break it off here. And uh, and with that, then I, I want to thank you so much. It's always fascinating. I learn something every time. And you have such a great story to tell about, uh, you know, everything that's related to Jesus, his resurrection, what the apostles uh, respond, how they responded to it. And then, of course, uh, of the history of the shroud and what that shroud means to all of us, whether we're Christians or non-Christians or Jews or whatever, that shroud is so meaningful to everyone. Yeah. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you. And, you know, it's uh, it's my favorite subject. So I can I can 
I can go on and on and on and on. Just ask my wife. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, where can uh, folks read uh, and learn more about you and uh, some of the things that you're doing? Just go to shroudencounter.com. That's my website. I have a Facebook, Shroud Encounter. Instagram page, Shroud Encounter. YouTube channel, <laughs> Shroud Encounter. I think you're getting a pattern here. And yeah. So just, just go look up Shroud Encounter. Shroud Encounter with uh, Russ Briault, uh, shroudencounter.com. Yeah. Uh, perfect. And you'll be able to find out uh, a lot more about uh, about Russ and uh, some of the things that he's working on. Otherwise, uh, to the audience, please stay tuned for many other videos in this series of the backstory on the Shroud of Turin. And please visit GuyPowell.com and sign up for more episodes. Russ, thank you so much. Thank you, Guy. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Take care.